All right. Um, unfortunately, I am repeating a video here because Canvas, for whatever reason, didn't record properly. So, uh, oh, well, it's a little frustrating. Uh, the following problems are going to align with problems 27 through 31 on the last test. And I believe we are now looking at 16 to 20 on the upcoming test. That's what they'll be numbered. So let's start with, um, let's start with slope of the line in terms of X. Uh, using a limit, a limit expression to represent the slope of a function at a given X value. Right, so let's start with uh, Y equals X squared. Let's start with a, an easy calculation. And I want to talk about slope right now. I'm trying to think back. There's a formula for slope. I'm trying to remember what it is. Oh, I, I do remember. It's uh, Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. Hmm. And in order to do that calculation, oh, that's right. You need two points. Two points. Hmm. I guess I'll make a table of values here. I guess I might as well use the calculation that we're highlighting. And I guess I better give you a, an x equals, how about x equals 3? Hmm. Well, I need some points. for. Oh, yeah. 3 gets me 9. Hmm. And this is about instantaneous rate of change, instantaneous rate of change. Hmm. I know if I have two points, well, that doesn't really give me the slope of the tangent because that's an average rate of change. I mean, I know I have an X, I have a second X here, right? Well, we'll just call, oh, I have a first X here, three, got a second X, but I think I want that X to uh, hmm, get closer. And closer to that point. Hmm. I wonder what that x value is. I don't know, but it's an x value that's getting closer to 3. You know, kind of like 3.01. But I can get even closer than that. So it's conceptual. Huh. Well, wait a minute. I got a first x. It goes there. I got a first y. That goes there. I got a second X, generic. I wonder what I get in this calculation if I use, oh, X squared. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Well, that's not necessarily the slope between these two points that represents instantaneous rate of change at three, unless this number is really going to three. Then I think I can find the number associated with that calculation. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I forgot to square that. All right, here I am doing another video. Think it would get better, but no, of course not. Second Y, right? There's my Y2. And, um, hmm. and I do know that uh, the derivative of X squared is 2X, and I know that 2 times 3 is 6. So this actually should give me 6 if I'm using the derivative process. As I said, it's rate of change in an instant. And I think the derivative is what gets us rate of change of an instant at an instant for any function. Take a derivative and you know how the table values are changing, right? I mean, we started the term. I don't know if you remember this. We started the term where I was having fun with you, trying to show you that I could square 3.001 and saying, oh, that's 9.06001. We kind of discounted that. We looked at the change in y over the change in x and we said oh that's six to one and then we did it with a bunch of other and we you know values and table values and we said oh looks like you're doubling the x at any instant and we also looked at doing this from the context of you know x plus three x minus three and the x minus threes divide out of the problem because that equals one and one times anything is what you're looking at no no reason i can't put three in now all right, it's six from a different perspective. But the whole purpose of this question is to make you see the derivative process because the course is broken up into two parts, differentiation 
in integration. And I'm trying to get you to see a little bit better the differentiation side of this course. So let's try another one. Uh, I guess I got to get an eraser uh, down on the floor. I can still bend down a little bit. That's good. Uh, there we go. There we go. So let's try it again. All right, let's look at a new function. Let's look at the square root of x. And let's uh, write a limit expression that represents y prime at 4. Let's do y prime at 4. OK, so y prime at 4 is the rate of change. It's the slope of the tangent. Oh, slope. Oh, yes, yeah, slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Yeah, I remember that now. And I'm looking at the square root of x. So I guess I got to get a table to get a couple of points. Oh, I better use four. I guess that's two. And I guess I got to get something close to four, like six. No, that's too far away. Five. No, that's too far away. 4.5. I'm getting closer to the slope of the tangent. Oh, these numbers are heading towards four. Why don't I say x? Oh, I got to take the square root of x. Oh, slope, square root of x minus four, minus two, excuse me, over uh, x minus four. And I guess if I see x going to four, I wonder if I look at this long enough, the four and the two, that might come into perspective. Of course, I'm looking for the value here, so we'll use the word limit because we can't, we're not talking about exactly four right now. We're just saying, hey, what's this moving towards? What am I moving towards? Oh, well, I know y prime is uh, one over two root x. It's the derivative of what's inside, which happens to be one over two times the square root of what's inside. I think I can throw a four in here. Well, I guess the answer to this is one fourth. Be interesting to see if you remember how I showed you with conjugates, the algebra. All right, I'm not going to do it again. Unless somebody wants me to, we'll do it in the help session. All right. Conjugating the numerator and the denominator. Uh, we did that way back when. So much to cover. So much to cover. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder. Hmm. I wonder what uh, I wonder what the derivative of g would be at five on slope. Y two minus y one over x two minus x. Well, I remember that formula better now. Now that I've done it several times in a row, and that's uh, the difference between two points. Yeah, the y value, two points. The difference in the y values and the difference in the x values. Well, that kind of looks like rise over run. Oh, yeah, that's, that's what I'm looking for. So I got to figure out what I get g of, I guess I get g of 5. And I got to get some numbers here. So I guess I got g of 5. That's my second y. Hmm. Oh, 5 is my first x. Hmm. Let's get a derivative. I think I got to get those points closer and closer together. Like if that was a, I got to get those. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's an x value that's going to 5. Hmm. Well, I guess that's what I get for a y value. I guess that's my second y value. I guess that's uh, my second x value. And I guess I want to know what that number is. Take the limit and find out. You know, in other words, do all the calculations, keep doing them till you get to something like 5.01 and g of 5.01. And I guess you're going to find out what g prime of 5 is. There you have it. All right, hoping that discussion helps somebody somewhere. I've got a few folks getting that right. Two or three people got that right on the last test. Uh, maybe we can get two or three more. Be nice if we got 20 more. All right, next question. 
Oh, my favorite, left and right hand rectangles. All right, so why don't we uh, take a graph? Let's use the square root of x. And let's do three left hand rectangles from two to four. Three left hand. One, two, three. I think the area of these three rectangles underestimates the exact area. I think there's some error here and here and here. Yeah. Okay, well, rectangles, area, rectangles is uh, height times width. Height is usually measured in math by the letter Y. I guess I got to get those three Y values and figure out what these widths are. Two to four, three widths. Why don't I do four minus two divided by three? Okay, I know the widths of the rectangles, two thirds. Two thirds, yep. I wish I could figure out a way, this is the square root of X. I wish I could figure out a way to get that Y value. Oh, it tells me up here that I take the square root of the X. Oh, so I guess that's a two. I guess I just found that two thirds times the square root of two is this area. And if I go two thirds in that direction, and I know two is six thirds, I think I'm at eight thirds. I wonder how I could get this y value. Oh, square root of that x. You know, I think the next one's the square root of 10 thirds. I think I'm done. Yeah, I think I'm done. Let's do another one. Yeah. F of X. Do right hand rectangles, right hand. Now let's go for three right hand rectangles from five to seven. Now let's do from five to 10. Do I want five rectangles? That's so many. Oh, man, let's just do two. Two right hand rectangles. So that all the way over to here. Geez, I can't. I guess this is an underestimate because that seems bigger than the little error there. And it's probably some there. And so I wanted right hand rectangles. I need this y value. And I don't have a clue how to find that. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, I do have a clue because the y values, the altitudes, are based on a calculation using the number 10. I think that y is f of 10. Now, I don't know what the function is. Looks like some kind of trig function with plus, you know, a little maybe x over five or something, you know, kind of a linear trig function. Anyway, not necessary. And then we got to take this one here. So I need this altitude and this altitude, the right-hand altitudes. Guess I got to find the number between five and 10, 15 divided by two. We'll go 7.5, we'll go decimally here. So I got to find this altitude. Oh yeah, I got to plug it into the calculation. So I got two calculations. I got F of 7.5 and I got F of 10. Then I got to have the width, five to 7.5. We'll do it decimally just because it's easier right now. Done. Let's do the ln of x, because I got a feeling some folks don't know how to graph the ln of x, so at least I'll talk about it briefly again. Uh -huh. ln of x, and we'll do left-hand rectangles again. So ln of zero is undefined. And this is the inverse of e to the x. So your x-axis is here. It passes through one comma zero, because e to the zero is one. And let's go from two, we'll do three rectangles. Let's go from two to six. Two to six, okay, and we're gonna do left hand, and we're just gonna do two. Oh, that's not halfway, but close enough, all right? <laughs> Riemann sums don't have to have equal widths, by the way. So I actually could do this one if I you know, knew that value, uh, then I could do two areas easily, but um, this is the ln of x. And I said we'd do two, we'll do them 
we'll do uh, two that are midpoint kind of a symmetric there. That's better. Still an underestimate. And so I do need this value. So I got six divided by two, and I'm only doing, did I said, well, I think I said three rectangles before. You can tell the math is too long today. Uh, so I want three rectangles. So six minus two divided by three. And I'll draw them now. That's better. That's better drawing, I think. One, two, three, close enough. All right, so width four over three. So I'm gonna write four over three times. I gotta get that altitude, that altitude, and that altitude, because I said left hand. Four thirds, so two is six thirds. So that makes that 10 thirds. And that makes that 14 thirds. And that makes that 18 thirds. Oh, I like to do that one because I know that I haven't made a mistake. Matches up. So I guess I'll go back to two for the first one. And I don't know what this height is here, this Y value. Let's see, this Y value. Oh, the ln of the X, about 0.7. Next one is the ln of 10 thirds. And then the last one is the ln of 14 thirds. And I think on the answer key in the last test, I asked for left and I gave you right in rectangles. You can see that as I go through the day, the later in the day, the slower the arithmetic process, I start to drool. All right, Vernon Nursing Home, here I come. So that's how you do that. And that's going to be problem number, this is the second one we did now? Or is that the first? Yeah, it's the second one. No, is that the first thing we've done? No, we did the slope. Okay, so 16 is the slope problem. So that would have been, that's going to be problem 17 on your test. 18 is going to do trapezoids, which is very similar. Trapezoids is the, you know, if you look at a trapezoid, all right, we got a left hand rectangle, we got a right hand rectangle, and the actual area is the average of those two. So that's why you divide the width by two, okay? Because you're really doing multiplying by two sides, left and right. And the average tells you the actual area of the trapezoid there. That's better, right? That's a trapezoid. Now maybe you can see why you're dividing left and right by two to get that area, okay? So width divided by two. And we'll do again the same ones. We'll do the square root of x. And we'll do from two to five. And we'll do... Uh, we'll do uh, three trapezoids from uh, uh, three to five. Three trapezoids from three to five. We'll go five to seven. All right, square root of x. We'll go from five out here to seven. Three trapezoids. So let me get that out of here, right there. Sort of right there, right there. So there's one trapezoid, right? Let's just go another dot there, increase. There's two trapezoids. Another dot out here. Okay, so uh, three trapezoids, not the best drawings. Okay, so I got to take the width and divide it by two. Well, three trapezoids, seven minus five over three is one width. We got to divide that by two. So I got two thirds. Dividing by two gives me the multiplier one third. Now I need this. This gets used twice, right? If I multiply it once, I only get one, one calculation for one trap. So we do the interior ones twice, okay? And I got to figure out this y value when we're looking at the square root of x. I wonder what that y value is. Well, it's, oh, that y value is a calculation. Oh, so that's the square root of five. Wow. And I'm going two thirds up. Three times five, 15 plus two, 17 thirds. Hmm. I'm going up another two thirds from there, 19 thirds. And if I go up another two, it's 21 over three. I guess I did that right. That's, a, that's unusual. Oh, square root of five, square root of seven, oh, times two. Remember that, I gotta remember that. The ones in the middle, all the ones in the middle have a doubling. And if you want to see the doubling more carefully, just do trapezoidal rule YouTube. It's five minutes of writing on the board and factoring and go do that. Please save me, save me doing it. Or you can just take it on faith. Two, square root of 19 over three. 
Last one we use once. Okay. Gonna use the same process. So, you know, I give you a function. F of X, I give you a function. Who the heck knows what it is? Okay, we'll, we'll do uh, two trapezoids. We'll just do two trapezoids under F of X from A to B. From A, now nah, I won't do A to B. We'll do from six to seven. Six to seven, two trapezoids. There's, oh God. There's one, there's two. Ugly looking critters. So what's the width? Well, I think this is six and a half, right? So the width's a half. You gotta remember to do what with the trapezoidal rule? Average of the left and right, so you gotta cut it in half. This width is a half, so I'm gonna multiply by a fourth. I need this altitude. I don't know what that y value is. Oh yeah, it's some calculation based on six. And I gotta double the one in the middle. So that's plus two times the calculation based on 6.5. And I gotta do the one on the right just once. That's the general form. So we'll do four trapezoids for ln of x from one to four. So from one to four, now I don't wanna do one because that's got zero for, well, We'll do from two to five. Okay, so two to five, that's one zero. Two to five is over here. And we're looking at y equals ln of x. Okay, so we got that one, that one, that one, and that one. It's, it's climbing very slowly, this function out on the right. So Five minus two, four trapezoids, gives me a width of three fourths. And we said you gotta take the average of left and right, so we're gonna multiply by three eighths. I've gotta get this y value. Oh yeah, that y value is based on that number. So that's the ln of two, I only use that once. Everything in the middle I use twice, and I'm going up uh, three fourths. So two times four is eight plus three. It's 11 fourths going up by three fourths, 14 fourths going up by three, 17 fourths going up 20 over four or five. Bingo. Did it right. I got to double this one. That's the ln of 11 fourths. I got to double that one to ln of 14 over four. I got to double that one, 2 ln of 17 over 4. I guess I'd run out of room. And we have to add the last one, which is the ln of 5, which is about 1.6, by the way. There you go. There's a trapezoidal rule. Now, I asked for four trapezoids, which means there better be five altitudes. Five altitudes in the parentheses. One, two, three, four, five. Yes. Yes, that's just another little tidbit of, hmm, might catch, catch a careless error. Oh, I don't think I'm catching many these days. Limit, in terms of X, we did that. We did Rex, traps, local max and mins. Local max and mins. Boy, Canvas, if you let me down, if you don't upload this properly for me or whatever went wrong the last time, I'm going to be mighty upset with you. And I might not talk to you again. All right, here we go. Mm -hmm. Purely a function of quarantine. Yes, stir crazy. All right, here we go. All right, let's see. Yeah. All right, here. I don't like these erasers. I'm going to ask for the wash glass back, or I'm going to buy some myself. All right, what am I doing? I forget. Local max and mins. All right, so let's find the local max. Mins. Well, here's some max and mins. There's something true about the max and min, and that's where slopes equal zero. And change signs, right? For instance, slopes are negative, then positive. I guess that gets me a min. Slopes are positive, then negative. I guess that gets me a max. Slopes are negative, then positive. 
I guess that's a min. Positive to negative, I guess that's a max. Negative to positive, I guess that's a min. Seems like there's a pattern there. All right, so here you go. Y equals um, x cubed minus 12x plus ah, five. Find the value of the local max for this problem. Well, I guess I got to find slopes. I wonder what calculation finds the slope at a point. Oh, yeah. Y prime. 3x squared minus 12. Which happens to be a parabola that goes through negative 2 and positive 2. Huh. And these are slopes. These y value, that y value right there tells me mom, my grandma's velocity, you know, rate of change. Gives me a rate of change. The rate of change is all about y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Kind of tells me that information. Huh. At 2, I know it's 0. If I'm to the left of 2, my slopes, my y values, oh, that y value is negative. That means something's going down. That y value is positive. Something's going up. So at 2, I think I have a minimum. That's what I'm after. And I can't remember what I asked at the beginning here. Did I, I think I asked max. Oh, I guess if that slope right there, that y value is measuring slopes, you know, the y values on this slopes, well, that's a positive slope. Something's going up. And then uh, that y value is a negative. Something's coming down. I guess I'm looking over here. So I guess I want to know what the y value is at negative 2. I already know at negative 2, slope is 0. And if I'm going down and then up, I guess I'm looking for the y value of that. So I put negative 2 in. I get negative 8. I get positive 24. I see a negative 3 to 1 ratio there. That's interesting. Wow, that's interesting. Negative 3 to 1 ratio of the linear to the quadratic. Wow, oh, isn't that cool? Because I know I get a negative 3 to 1 ratio at the point of inflection, but that's not the ratio of linear to quadrat to cubic, linear to cubic term. No. No, that 3 to 1 ratio is quadratic to cubic term. Ah, isn't that interesting that I get a 3 to 1 ratio for different questions? Hmm. Inquiring minds might ask why. Oh, anyway, I'm back to this. You're just trying to get two points, right? Nah, you're really trying to understand what's going on, I hope. So when I see that 3 to 1 ratio, then when I add those together, I know it's twice the opposite of that. It's 16. Then I don't have to think about it. 16 plus 5, well, that's 21. That's your answer to this. So let's actually, uh, so 21's your answer. Let's actually graph this real quick. So we're starting at 5 on the y-axis. We're going down at 12 to 1, but it's cubic, so it's got to do this, and it's got to do that. And what I'm suggesting to you is that's a coordinate negative 2, comma, uh, what the hell did we say? 20, excuse me, my French. I think we said 21, didn't we? Oh, oh yeah, I wrote it. That's what that is. Yeah, wow. Woo! <laughs> and I actually know that negative 12 is the point of inflection right there. Right? And I actually know that I could find that by doing h plus or minus the square root of negative m over 3a. Hmm. <laughs> Not interesting. h in this case is 0 plus or minus the slope at the point of inflection is the opposite of negative 12. And if I divide that by 3 times a, 3, I get plus or minus the square root of 4, which happens to give me the numbers 2 and negative 2. And those were very important to this problem before, because that's the one that gave us that in the original equation. You might wonder where I got that formula from. Inquiring minds want to know. All right, let's do another problem. I'm proud of that little formula. No, no let's change the function here. Let's just do the, the, the maximum value for uh, 
and I'm going to call it a local max, even though it's an absolute max. There's a little tweak to this process in the second half of the term where we look at open intervals and closed intervals. We'll look at that after midterm. Just a little tweak. You know, I mean, I can have a local max. I can have a window that looks like this. Starts here. Um, well, it starts here. And then it comes down like this, up like that, ends up over here. Well, what's the absolute max? It's actually, it's actually that Y value. Okay, so, but we'll talk about that after midterm. Right now, let's just do a kind of a Y equals, just with calculus, find the, find the maximum value of minus X squared plus eight X minus 10. We know it's one of these things, right? right? Okay, so how do we find it? Slopes, sorry, Y prime, Y prime minus two X plus eight. So we now know that equals zero, X equals four. So we put four in, we have minus 16 plus 32. Oh yeah, that two to one ratio for the quadratic, minus 10. So what's the range of this thing? Minus 16, minus 10, minus 22. Oh no, minus 16 plus 32, positive 16 minus 10, sorry. Positive six is the maximum Y value of this function. Now, proving it, minus two X, Minus eight, here's eight minus two X. At positive four, these are slope values. Slope's positive, then negative means the function's going up, then coming down. Okay, proves the max. All right, let's do another one. This time let's do minus, minus X cubed. Minus X cubed. Uh, let's do, uh, probably this is on the test, I don't know plus 27x, this is actually the graphing form for a cubic, plus three, uh, find the value of the local max. Now you can pause the video, just gonna do it. So y prime equals minus three x squared plus 27. We set that to zero to get our candidates. <coughs> so let's get rid of that. Let's make this equal to minus 27. Uh, oh Christ, I shouldn't do this. I'm gonna make some stupid, some stupid error because I'm tired. So forgive me. So minus three X squared equals minus 27. Okay, now I can get rid of them. So divide by three, nine. So plus or minus three are the candidates. Um, minus three X squared plus 27. I'll look at it graphically. Bumpity, bumpity, bumpity. So it changes. Slope values change from negative to positive and positive to negative. So this one is negative to positive. That's gonna be the min. So that's gonna be the max. And I asked for max, that's good. So I'm over here, positive slopes, negative slopes, max on this side. So I'm gonna put three in here. That's gonna be minus 27, that's 81. Whoa, there's that three to one linear to cubic. So that's gonna become positive 54. When I put these together, add three. So that's 57. So if that's my answer, my answer is 57. And now let's just graph this backwards. So we started a Y value of three. I am going up, so I don't want the three there. I want it here going up pretty steeply, but it's a negative cubic. So down, up. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely positive three is where that local max is going to occur, right? Because this is like arrow. So that works nicely. All right, did slope, local max. Oh yeah, I gotta do the one that I butchered on the, on the test. I gotta go back for my own interest over the weekend. I'm gonna go back and look at all those tests again. And I'm sure some scores are gonna change. I know I butchered Jacob's score. I missed a page for God's sakes. But I had a lot going on that day. All right, so I'm gonna go back, but it's really, it's really next week. You got three tests next week, all right? One, on Tuesday that shows me that you're looking at these videos and you're making some gains. That's what I'm really hoping for. Okay. I should plant something in here, you know, some statement where you come in and you, uh, and, and then I know you looked at them or whatever. So we're going to do the square root of 24.9. How do I find that? Using equation of line tangent, equation of line tangent to a curve. What curve? I think the square root of X. How do you, Write the equation line. You need a point and a slope. 
okay? And I'm gonna use something to approximate that. Well, I think I'm gonna use that equals that for this. So what X and what Y am I using? 25 and five. So over here, I write X minus 25 and then I write five. Now I need the slope. How do I find the slope of this? Take a derivative, one over two root X. Well, that's my X that I'm using. So if I plug that in, I get one tenth over here. One over 10. Now I can use this number to get an approximation of that. But instead of using the square root function, I'm using a line. Square root function does that, right? I've got 25, five. I'm trying to figure out what this one is. Well, you tell me how far that line is away from that Y value. Very close. You got to zoom in to see any error. You wouldn't see it on Desmos. So I got to plug 29, 24.9. Okay, so that's one tenth times minus one tenth plus five. I hope I don't butcher this. So this is five minus one over 100. I'm gonna write 500 minus one, 499 over 100. That's how I'm gonna express it. Or you could have said four and 99 one hundredths. Either one, hopefully, um, I will spot it and correct it properly. I don't know what I wrote, my answer key, oh my God. What a tough day the old guy had. All right, let's try another one. I'm only doing square roots and cube roots. After midterm, we might, you know, get some other functions involved, but we're trying to just get a process down here. So let's take a cube root. Let's take a cube root of 8.2. Okay, is there a cube root that's close to 8. Oh yeah, cube root of eight, gets me two. I think I'm going to build a line off of eight comma two. I think I'm going to write X minus eight plus two. Okay. I guess we got to find the slope of this function. And that's been on uh, worksheets and tests. How do you take that derivative? I think you rewrite it as X to the one third. And then I think you apply your rules of one third X to the, we're gonna subtract one here. That gets me minus two thirds. And now you're back to your old classes, algebra one, algebra two, and pre-cal, somewhere along the line, somebody's supposed to have taught you how to do that for that number eight. Doesn't matter the order, but that's reciprocal squaring cube rooting. I'm gonna do cube root of eight first, two, two squared, four, Reciprocal of four, one fourth times one third is one twelfth. If you don't know how to do that, replay what I just said. Replay it five times. Now I'm gonna drop 8.2. Okay, so that's two tenths, which is one fifth times one twelfth, which is one over 60. And I'm gonna add two. There, I'm done. Just call it two and one sixtieth or 121 over 60 from our grade school work. I don't know what they call that, a mixed number or something, I forget. All right, All right. you forget everything if you don't work with it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think that's the second one we did. Let's do one more. Now let's go back to square root. Let's do the square root of, uh, I don't know, 81.3. Now, the further I get away from 81, the less that linear function approximates uh, it uh, correctly. I don't know what I just said. The more error accrues there. That was said better. All right. The further you get away, the more error between the curve and your line. But we're pretty close. If we pick the square root of 81 equals nine, all right, so what number did I put into the square root? 81, so I'm building this off of 81 and nine, and then I'm gonna get, you know, three tenths here, right? When I drop in 81.3. So I gotta get the, uh, I hope you got that memorized. I hope you got the derivative of the square root of X memorized. It's the derivative of what's inside, which is one over two times what's inside. Okay, and I'm obviously gonna work with 81 here. I sure don't know what the square root of 81.3 is. 
So the square root of 81 is uh, 9 times 2, 18. So I'm going to do 1 over 18. I'm going to add 9, and I hope I don't butcher it. I've been trying to do these in my head, just putting answers on the answer key. I'm going to write out the answer key to the next test. I'm not going to make a video. I'm going to do a written uh, answer key so that I have a nice pencil, line up my equal signs. You can see the work. Okay. Uh, 3 goes into 18, 6. So I got 9 and 1 60th. That's your answer. All right, just to do that quickly. And uh, we're done with this video. I think I did five things. I hope I did. Uh, and, uh, and I hope you look at it. Okie dokie, ending for all. And for all, an ending.